control. Breach in five, four, three. What's up, guys? It's Uncle Freedom coming to you on another glorious and well-deserved day off. Actually, my only day off this week because we've got guys out of town and I will basically just be at work. And I had a guy have a conversation with me and he brought up a really, really interesting point that I thought would make a great video. So today we're going to discuss deciding on what's important to you. So if that sounds fun and interesting to you, go ahead and like, subscribe, tell a friend. The channel's growing. If you're looking to support the channel, take a look down in the description box below. You'll find a link that goes to my link tree where all of the affiliates of the channel exist. People like Barely, where I buy my ammunition. Primary Arms, where I buy a bunch of, a bunch of stuff that I don't tell my wife about. Because she'll kill me. Anyway, um, so deciding on what's important to you. Now, the crux of this was we were discussing handguns and handgun modifications and the things that we do to handguns and rifles um, specifically. And it was why we do the things that we do. And I was like, dude, this is, this is gold. Like, I, I like this. So let's say we're going to do this from the crux of a handgun, right? So handgun. So the first thing we have to decide with this is what it is that I want it to do. Do I want it to live on my battle belt? Do I want it to be a defensive weapon? Do I want it to be a concealed carry firearm? Do I want to carry a deep concealment? Do I want to shoot competitions? What about home defense? Is it a duty gun for work? What do I want this thing to do? Because that question will determine every single thing I do to this. So the next question I'm going to have for this, once I've decided what I want it to do, is how do I intend on carrying it? Now, sometimes what you want it to do will actually solve the problem of how you intend to carry it. Being if you want it to be a battle belt gun, it's going to go on your battle belt. Um, if you're buying a gun specifically for deep concealment, obviously you're going to conceal it. But in a situation like this guy, this gun is not only going to be carried in concealed carry, it'll also be carried on duty, it'll also be used for training, uh, and this would be the Minuteman handgun. But how do I want to carry it? Because now I have to come up with a solution for how I'm going to carry it. But if my objective is deep concealment, that is going to limit some of the things that I can do to this handgun because it makes it harder to conceal. The next question I'm going to ask myself is, what caliber do I want this thing to shoot? Now, I talked a little bit about this. I'll leave a link at the uh, duty choosing a duty handgun um, where I, I went over kind of the merits of your basic handgun ammunition. For me, it's going to be a 9mm. Um, again, because ballistic technology is a thing and we have made modern advancements into it, I can do everything in the world with a 9mm that most people can do with any other caliber. And I can do that with less recoil, more capacity. So I'm going to pick the 9mm. So my next thing I'm going to do is, so I've decided why, like what I want this to accomplish. I've decided how I'm going to carry this. And I've decided what caliber it needs to be into. Well, now I need to figure out, like, what is what am I predicted to engage with this thing, right? Sometimes that question gets answered along the way. If you want a competition handgun that you're going to carry outside the waist uh, all the time in a competition holster in 9mm because it's got the least amount of recoil, well, I mean, I'm going to kill paper targets and steel plates. That's what I'm going to do with it. But this gun, I still need to kill paper targets, steel plates, but also possibly predators if I'm hiking two-legged and four-legged. Because it's a duty gun, I need to be able to shoot through barriers with this. So glass, wood, metal, sheetrock, heavy clothing. So I know that. And I know that I need to be able to shoot this consistently inside of 50 yards and hit what I want to hit. So now we're drawing a clear picture of what I need this platform to do. Well, then you're going to ask yourself a question, which is, do I need special equipment? I don't know. Do you? That's a question you have to answer. Are you a lefty, right? 
That means you may need ambidextrous slide stops. That may, need, may mean you need to flip your mag release around. Maybe you need to have a better consideration into uh, the light because of the way the light is activated or a certain light. Um, maybe you have giant hands and you're going to need a back strap. Maybe you require a mag weld so you can get a little better like pressure down here. I know that does work for me pretty well. Um, maybe none of the stock options for grip work for you and you need to have it stippled. Maybe you need a more aggressively stippled frame from the factory. Maybe if you're a SIG guy, you need to buy a different grip module that provides that grip. Maybe the answer is just to put goon tape on it. Um... Here's the problem. I will tell you this. If you were looking at goon tape because it says goon, you were like, yeah, goon tape, high speed operator crap. Just buy some Howie's hockey tape. It comes in more colors and it's the same damn thing. But hockey tape does work. I do use it a lot on different firearms. It will actually works pretty well to suck some of the moisture off of your hand and keep you going. Um, I know some guys that have used this stuff before. So this is friction tape. It's on a tomahawk because freaking tomahawk. That's why. Um, so yeah, I'm going to like, you have to figure out kind of what specialized thing you need to do. Maybe that frame, there's no way for you to make it fit your hand. So you need to pick a different gun, even if you like that one. So then we're going to ask questions. All right, cool. So I've got all this figured out. What about my sighting system? If you have a Glock, the sights suck. Sorry. Glock perfection, except the plastic placeholder sights that you're going to have to replace because they're terrible. So... Do I need night sights? Is that a requirement for what I do? Um, most law enforcement agencies do require some form of night sight. It's an outdated way of looking because night sights are only functional like it like one time. A, well, they happen twice a day. <laughs> it's like right before dark. Um, but I will tell you, if you turn on a weapon mounted light, those sights no longer matter because you can't see them anyway because you turned on a thousand lumen light. Um, also, I will tell you that if you were like me, you're a red dot guy, having a floating dot up here creates a second dot through here. And if you were ever shooting through night vision, you just have two dots. And that's not the best way to do it. They're also, they can be distracting. Maybe as a competition guy, you need fiber optic, which personally for me, I like fiber optic sights, just not in a configuration like this. I like blacked out sights. Um, do I need the sights to be taller because I'm going to be shooting over a suppressor? Do I need them to be taller because I need them to co-witness through an optic? Do I want the sights to be lower third co-witness? Do I want them to be lower quarter, 16th? Do I want them to be absolute co-witness? I will never recommend absolute co-witness because you lose like 60% of your freaking window on your optic. But what do I need it to do? Um, you know, and, and the thing, the other thing to think about is as you're looking at this is how high these need to be for a, a witness through your optic is highly dependent on how the slide is milled, what plate you ended up using, or like this one, it's a direct mill. So I have the lowest available option. That's another thing. All sites are different sizes. Even if they have the same footprint, they may have a different depth. Um, another thing people don't think about when we talk about sites is sites are ultra important for one-handed manipulation so wounded shooter drills if you have a red dot i can just smash this red dot off of things to rack the gun if not i can use a more shelf-like rear sight to manipulate the firearm that is something i we do in schools we teach to people it, it's it, it is what it is but that is an option you have to think about that glock factory sites don't do so now we've decided on a sites Dude, what about a new barrel, man? I need a better barrel. Because I'm ultra accurate, so I need a better barrel. I have never met anybody that can outshoot a stock Glock barrel. Um, the new barrel, the Marksman barrel here, is incredibly accurate. I couldn't outshoot that Glock bar barrel before this one, so I, I damn sure can outshoot this one. Now, there is the chance you may actually need um, a, a, a better barrel. Like, for example, this guy. This is a Radiant Ramjet and Afterburner. So this is the Afterburner barrel with the Ramjet compensator, or the Afterburner compensator with the Ramjet barrel. The barrel is ported and is tapped in such a way that the compensator self-times. That's a reason to get it. Um, any of the other thread-on comps, maybe that's why you need a threaded barrel. Maybe you're going to run a booster in a can. Well, you need a threaded barrel to do those things. 
But quite frankly, outside of those options, I have never seen a reason for a threaded barrel. I will never understand people that go out and buy a threaded barrel for their Glock and then put a Strike Industries threat protector on there or a Rival Arms threat protector because it looks cool. That's dumb. Um, and I will tell you that was dumb. But reality, you're shooting a Glock, a SIG, or something like that. The odds of you out shooting this factory barrel, you being so accurate that you need a better barrel, <laughs> you can lie to yourself, but I'm going to call you out on it. So the next one would be like this Radian compensator, right? Compensators are awesome because they keep the firearm shooting flatter. The hotter the ammo, the better the comp works. But here's the problem. I will see people that buy a compensator and they buy a compensator to compensate for their inability to have rock solid fundamentals and how they grip the gun because the gun's got a lot of recoil and they're trying to tame it instead of fixing their freaking grip, which would just solve the problem to begin with. Another problem we see with comps is people put comps on handguns and because it tames the recoil, they allow their fundamentals to slip in such a manner that if they shoot a gun that is not comped, it's bad. Don't be that guy. You have to shoot a compensated gun just like you shot it when it was uncompensated because that's when you get the benefit of like your tamed recoil flatter shooting gun because you're doing all the rest of the stuff right. There is another problem with compensators. Um, compensators cause malfunctions. They, they do. People don't like to talk about that because they're super cool and this is ultra high speed. Compensators for the most part, this one um, in all of the research I have done, is probably one of the best options for not creating that problem. You will hear people discuss things like, oh, I have to shoot 124, I can't shoot this, or I have to hot ride the load to do this. Guys that shoot a lot of USPSA that are shooting Grandmaster Open Division, trust me, if you have a friend that does that, go ask them about the problems with running a comp, and they will tell you how they dialed in the one load that runs that gun effectively and doesn't cause malfunctions. You may also have to look into other problems with that, which would bring you your next one, which was, uh, I need a tungsten guide rod or better springs. Uh, maybe, but you have to think is every single step that we take in this thing that takes this away further from stock decreases its reliability. Having a slide milled can cause reliability problems. Putting an aftermarket barrel could possibly cause reliability problems. A compensator can cause reliability, reliability problems. Replacing your recoil springs with a lighter weight recoil spring can cause problems. Maybe it won't go back into battery as fast. Maybe it short strokes the gun because you're taking away too much pressure and the spring's too heavy. Like there's a ton of stuff you can do. And yeah, you can tailor this stuff out, especially when we're using a comp. But every step we take takes this away from reliability as a working tool. So maybe if you're a competitor, but here's the thing. I would argue this. If you're going to shoot competitions, most of those guys' guns are dialed into the point where they will just flat run. Because like having a malfunction is the difference from making money at the match and just turning like money into noise. So the next one we're going to talk about is like, oh, do we need a light? I need a light. I am a firm believer you need a light. I'm going to go ahead and tell you if your stuff's got a rail on it, you need to put a light on it. Um, but you need to keep in mind, even with a light, I am changing the overall profile of this firearm if I intend to carry it concealed. I'm going to create a bulkier option below my waist. Something as simple as this. You see all this, this extra stuff over here? That's because I have a light. But to me, the trade-off is there. It's worth it because my predicted use for this requires me to have a good light. If you're buying a light because it looks cool and you want that Instagram clout, good on you for buying a light. Probably wouldn't have it for that reason only. But it is going to, you know, create more bulk, possibly discomfort when you carry it. Triggers, man. You got to get rid of that factory Glock trigger. You got to get you an Overwatch Precision or you insert your brand, right? Now, here's the thing. Overwatch and uh, Apex. They've been approved for use in a lot of departments, right? They, they do clean up the standard Glock stuff. But again, anything we start changing away from factory, that's why you see most of the triggers you will see use a factory Glock trigger bar because that prevents them from causing stupid malfunctions. Uh, even an example like this Hive Monarch, right? This Hive Monarch has adjustable. I can adjust my pre-travel, my, my wall, my over-travel, but it uses a factory Glock trigger bar. But a lot of times... What can happen, especially with the Glock, that you may need to adjust this is something as simple as replacing the factory connector with a minus connector. 
which will lighten up your pull weight by about two pounds. But you, you just need to come, come to terms with it. I mean, do you just need a better shoe? Maybe that's what you need to do. Maybe you just need to replace the factory Glock shoe with a better shoe. Um, you, you know, do you actually need to replace the springs? Would it be better to replace the connector? These are questions you have to ask yourself because everything we do is we start stacking modifications to one of these makes this less reliable. And if it's unreliable, it's a hammer. Red dots. I'm a fan of red dots. I love red dots on handguns. It's, it's practically a cheat code. However, how do you want to run it, man? Are we going to run a plate? Are we going to send it in to have it direct milled? Or, um, are, you, are you prepared to spend the ammo required and dry fire time required to become proficient at finding this dot on the draw every time? If you are not willing to put in that effort, don't get a freaking dot because you're going to come up and go, there it is. And that's what's going to happen. You're also going to run into the issue because you didn't spend enough time training there. You're going to come out and present. And you're going to be like, that's almost good now, right? You should be able, if you're going to run a dot, get your training level like, look, there's my dot, right? It should come up. You should see your dot. You should be target focused. You shouldn't find yourself looking at the dot itself, but you have to ask yourself these questions. Otherwise, you are essentially throwing money at a problem. Are you ready to get a better holster for your outside the waistband? Because a lot of outside the waistband holsters, take this guy, for example, this won't fit a red dot. I have to get a different holster that'll fit this red dot. Sometimes even your red dot holsters won't fit all red dots. These are problems you have to sort out and ask yourself before you go down this road. Otherwise, you're just buying crap. The next one, and this is a, just a red dot only thing. Oh my God, if I get an open emitter, I'm going to get killed in the streets because the one drop of sand is going to land or mud or rain or fog or whatever's going to land on there. It's going to be a problem and I'm going to die. I'm going to get killed in the streets because I can't see the freaking dot. Uh, if you get a closed emitter, it'll fog up and you'll have a problem. Or I'm shooting through the tube. There are benefits to a closed emitter dot. I will tell you as law enforcement, me being outside forced to be in locations that are rainy, windy, dusty, dirty, snowy, a closed emitter dot has definite, definite uses for me. But I will tell you, I have only ever seen a open emitter red dot have problems a couple times with me at classes. And typically I can be fixed by, oh, there's no dot. Okay, look, there's my dot, right? Some people say, oh, but the window will get crap all over it. Well, if the window gets crap all over it, I can't see the freaking, I can't see through it any freaking way. So I'm going to be occluded shooting like, look, there's the dot on the screen I can't see, and I'm going to pull the trigger. But that goes back to, you have to do it. And then, then the next question is, wow, it's 2 MOA dot, 6 MOA dot, 9 MOA dot, 3.5 MOA dot. All red dots are undurable. They're not worthy to put on a handgun. That will just fail on you. Um, what zero do I zero my dot at now that I've, I've done this? These are questions you need to really ask yourself. Um, personally, for me, I do a 15-yard zero on my pistol dots. I have found that to be most effective for my engagement range. Uh, zero to 50 yards, what I would shoot with a dot for work. Um, 15 yard zero works the best. I'm not really jumping up and down above stuff. That said, 10 yard zeros work well. 25 yard zeros work well, but you need to pick the one you want and you need to get the best zero that you can. As far as durability goes, whether or not you think a, an optic should be durable, not durable, I would refer you to Aaron Cow and his Sage Dynamics. Just search on YouTube for the optic. That man has pretty much shot them all and tried to break or broken them all. The other big one I see with this. And I see this a lot, which is guys get dots and they zero it for like 115 grain full metal jacket or 125 full metal jacket and then immediately slap in a good old plus P defensive load. Kudos on buying this, but if you're going to do this, you need to make sure you're ready to expend this because this optic has to be zeroed for this ammo, not my training ammo, right? I, I mean, I want to be accurate with my training ammo because that's more fun when it's satisfying and you put all the, the holes in the same thing you're supposed to put them into. But if I put all the holes with the same thing I'm trying to put it onto and my zero for my duty ammo is three inches off, well, it does me no freaking good because the time I'm going to count on it, I'm going to miss. So you're going to have to ask yourself, are you willing to spend that money? The next one is going to be, do you have the maintenance equipment required for this handgun? And are you willing to buy it? That means the batteries, 
2032s, right? Do you have spare batteries? CR123s, mod lights in 18350. My handhelds are 18650s. Are you prepared to have the batteries required for you to maintenance this stuff? There are parts of this that will freaking break. They break down over time. You have to understand that just because you bought this thing doesn't mean it's going to last for freaking ever. I mean, your recoil spring assembly has got like a 5,000 round life on it, and that's pushing it. You're going to have to replace that stuff. You might have to do a full spring change every 25,000 rounds. Maybe you'll never shoot 25,000 rounds. I would tell you to go train more because if you're not shooting 25,000 rounds, at least in a five-year window, you're not training enough. This is a perishable skill. Go shoot. But you have to be sure you're ready to maintain that stuff. And in addition to being sure that you're ready to maintain it, you're willing to spend the money on the parts, you also need to understand how to freaking do it. Um, I will tell you for a Glock, this is the only tool I need, and I can tear this whole thing apart. Cool Glock punch you get when you go to the Glock Armor School, which is basically how to unleto the black brick gun. The next one, and this is the important part I'll leave you with on this, is you need to work your way through this question list and talk to yourself and be realistic when you answer yourself. Don't lie to yourself. Don't do things because it looks cool. You need to answer these questions before you start building out a firearm. And the reason being is because you will begin throwing away money, either chasing or correcting problems that you have because of a decision you've made. If you put a barrel in your gun and that thing is inaccurate as crap, get rid of the freaking barrel, right? But do your research ahead of time because if you did, like lone wolf conversion barrels are really accurate. They're nice. The Radian Ramjet comp, that thing's awesome, and it cycles reliably with a factory recoil spring of 115 grain. Believe me, everybody's tested it, and it still works. Um, but you need to ask yourself these questions before you start tearing these things apart. Because there's no reason to spend more money than you have to. Yes, it could be a great learning experience, but again, be realistic about what you're doing and why you're doing it, more importantly than anything else. And above all, as with anything we're going to do, and this guy included, once I have determined what it is I need it to do, how, what caliber I'm going to shoot, how it's going to be carried, I'm going to come up with a plan. I'm going to plan out what I do to this firearm. And some of the stuff's big chunks you can do right away. The sights, the dot, the light, right? Big things bolted on, looks really cool right out of the gate. But when I start planning and changing things out. Like if I change the, the connector to a minus connector, if I want to replace the trigger shoot, which I'm, I'm looking at for this particular one, when I put the Radian Ramjet on here, I planned this out specifically so that as I changed things, I would go to the range and I would shoot them to ensure that I did not make this platform unreliable. Because what you will see is people will use 30 different modifications at one time and have no freaking clue why it doesn't run when they go to the range. Don't do that. Replace one thing at a time, verify the function of the firearm, then replace another thing. Because if you don't, you're going to spend all this time chasing things and blaming it on things that's not the freaking problem. Hoover thought, pro tip, whatever you want to call it. So guys, decide what's important when you build your handgun. Make a plan. Modify the gun one step at a time, test it to make sure you're not getting reliability malfunctions because the last thing we want to do is take one of the most reliable platforms ever created and turn it into a one-shot wonder. So I am Uncle Freedom. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Till next time, I'll see you later.